Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, honoured guests, on behalf of the University of Maryland and the College of Behavioural and Social Sciences, I offer you an extremely warm welcome to the inaugural lecture of the third holder of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace, Professor Hoda Mahmoudi. Uh, my name is John Townsend. Uh, I'm the Dean of the College of Behavioural and Social Sciences. I should like to begin by thanking the very talented group of student musicians who have kindly and skillfully provided a suitable prelude to our proceedings. So please join me in thanking them. <laughs> also on the same theme, I should like to acknowledge a special group of students who are helping with tonight's event, namely the BSOS Ambassadors. These volunteers assist us with the planning, coordination and execution of special events hosted by the college and let us thank them as well for all their help. Thank you. Well, for the University of Maryland with a new president who some of us have heard from and who very unfortunately just could not be here even though he very much wanted to be, to be so, uh, this is a wonderful time for the University of, of Maryland. So many new things are, 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 are happening. Above all, the Baha'i Chair for World Peace promotes global dialogue and understanding, as do our other colleges, other uh, colleges, other endowed chairs, the Sadat Chair for Peace and Development and the George and Lisa Sakhan Khalil Gibran Chair for Values and Pre and peace. I'd like to acknowledge Professor Shibli Dalhami in the audience, <laughs> holder of the. And of course, our very own Professor Sahil Bashruri, who we'll be hearing from a little bit later. <laughs> the existence of, of no fewer than three endowed peace chairs underscores the overarching mission of the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences namely to identify viable solutions to the world's greatest challenges. The faculty, staff and students of our college act on this mission every day through our research, our partnerships, our teaching, our commitment to innovation and entrepreneurship and our active engagement with the wider world. Equally important, our college attempts to bring the wider world home to our campus by maintaining a remarkably diverse and rich group of departments, faculty, staff, students, alumni and collaborators. But even in our breadth and diversity, we as a college are unified in our desire to make a positive impact at local, national and indeed global levels. With respect to the role of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace, Every moment of transition, such as the installation of a new incumbent, is yet an op another opportunity to look forward. Shortly, Professor Mahmoudi will do just that by explaining her strategic vision that will t guide the next cycle of the Baha'i Chair's development. Transitions also allow us to pause, glance back over our collective shoulder and reflect on the nature of our journey and the pathways we have taken. In this regard, the distinguished speakers I will begin introducing momentarily belong to what can be called the founding generation of the Baha'i Chair. Together they embody the Chair's vital institutional history and living memory. I would like to acknowledge one facet of that memory in history. Since the inauguration of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace almost 20 years ago, the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States has been a source of continuous wise advice and counsel to the successive holders of the chair as well as to the University of Maryland's leadership. The National Spiritual Assembly also has consistently provided the Baha'i chair with what, what can be called the sinews of scholarship, namely generous financial support. For these reasons and many more, I am deeply honoured that so many of the members of the National Spiritual Assembly are present with us tonight, and I would just ask them briefly to please stand and be acknowledged. If you would, the members would please stand. We are also very grateful that the Baha'i community is represented here tonight by another contingent of its most distinguished members, namely the Board of Continental Advisors, who as a body are charged with assisting national Baha'i communities in their development. Uh, would you please also give them a very well-deserved round of applause. Would you please stand? 
please. Our first distinguished speaker is Mr. Ken Bowers, who has served since 2007 as the Secretary of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States. In recent years, he's also acted as the Assembly's liaison to the Advisory Board of the Baha'i Chair. In that capacity, he has periodically visited the University of Maryland to participate in chair events and to lead strategic planning meetings of the Chair's Advisory Board. Before becoming Secretary, Mr. Bowers served, Bowers served as the National Spiritual Assembly's Deputy Secretary and also published a very well-received study of the Baha'i Faith. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Ken Bowers. So, uh, as a small acknowledgement uh, uh, of our appreciation of the work of the Baha'i National Assembly, it gives me great pleasure to award the Dean's Distinguished Service Medal. Uh, I normally, whenever I make an award, I take advice. This is mine to give to who I see fit, and I'm delighted to say that I'm honoured to present it to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was very sweet. Just before I let you say a few words, Please. may I make it clear, this is thanks for your very substantive support, but more importantly, it's for the inspiration and leadership you provided in support of peace and the scholarship so important to underpin its pursuit. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Let's say a few words. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean Townsend. I'd, I'd like to express in turn the deep gratitude of the National Spiritual Assembly for the leadership of the University of Maryland and yours in particular by way of a few remarks about a shared vision. It has been said that civilization is the social expression of the human spirit, that spirit being the aggregate of our collective intellect, our culture, our values. In short, those things that we share and reflect together as human beings in our common quest for good. And in our modern age, we've become accustomed to the idea that civilization progresses, but we're also keenly aware that no progress happens on its own accord. The past century has taught us that it is just as possible and perhaps easier for societies to slip into destruction as it is for them to advance along a positive path. Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i Faith, taught that human beings are created by God to carry forward an ever-advancing civilization, but that to do this requires unremitting commitment to certain essential universal ideals. Together, these principles describe the means whereby every person can reach his or her full potential, achieve lasting happiness, prosperity in its full sense, both material and spiritual, and contribute his or her full share to society's onward progress. These are described in summary form in a statement that was issued in the mid-1980s entitled The Promise of World Peace by the chief governing body of the Baha'i Faith, the Universal House of Justice. And in fact, it was that statement, The Promise of World Peace, that inspired the establishment of this Baha'i chair. Among the principles outlined in that document are the unfettered quest for truth, the commitment to education, and the conscious pursuit of justice and opportunity for all. Particularly as we emerge into a truly global society, it is essential that we cultivate an unshakable consciousness of the oneness of humanity with all that it implies, including freedom from prejudice, pursuit of diversity, equal opportunities for women and men, consciousness of the organic interdependence of all peoples on the planet, and the creation of a world-embracing ethic that features international dialogue, consultation, and problem-solving with the interests of all parties sincerely upheld. If humanity is to emerge successfully into the new world that is now coming into being, 
It will be to the degree that people of goodwill are able to work together to achieve these ends. The members of the Baha'i community consider it therefore a great blessing to have found at the University of Maryland partners who exemplify these ideals. The university has a well-demonstrated commitment to diversity. It has both an outstanding international vision and an exemplary record of community service here in the state of Maryland. And above all, it has a relentless drive for academic excellence. These values have proven themselves time, again in ver time and again in very practical ways because we ourselves, in the course of the two decades of our association with the university, have seen it vault, literally, f into the front ranks of elite institutions around the world. In the case of the Baha'i Chair, it was a member of this university's faculty, the late Dr. Edward Azar, who had the vision to see the connection between the principles taught by Baha'u'llah and the values of this institution, and to understand the potential in such a partnership to advance discourse on peace and the means of achieving it. We take great pride in the achievements of the chair to date, and we wish to offer special thanks to Dr. John Grazel and Dr. Sohail Bushri, the original holder and the most recent holder of the chair. And of course, we wish to wish our dear friend, Dr. Hoda Mahmoudi, great success in building upon their work, confident that the chair will, under her leadership, reach new heights. Especially, though, we would like to thank uh, our very good friend, Dean John Townsend, whom we have come to know as a man of great principle and dedication, warm-hearted and generous with his time and with the energy that he has given into, in the support of this chair. And we won't leave it at just a word. We have a gift for you, if you don't mind, John. So if Mike is here, or, oh, you're here. Okay, so let's... Okay, John, why don't you, if you don't mind... Take it from the top. There is a very renowned calligrapher who is an Iranian, but who emigrated to China some 20 or 30 years ago. I don't know exactly when. And during the course of his years in China, he has become renowned as a master calligrapher in Chinese. His name is Farzam Kamalabadi. And in honor of this very event, Mr. Kamalabadi asked permission to give something to the National Spiritual Assembly that the Assembly could give to John Townsend in token of appreciation for his leadership at the university. And here it is. Now, you're welcome. We'll have it delivered somehow to you. <laughs> yes. Yes, we'll have it rolled back, if you don't mind. Someone can come back. Don't, I hope Jan didn't leave for the evening, because oh, she's got more work to do. Here we are, Anthony, if you don't mind. That's wonderful. Thank you so very, very much. And we'll explain. And I'll just explain what it was. It, the, the inscription is, Tao gave birth to all. Tao created all. And what this is is a reference to the Tao, uh, which is the invisible unknown essence, being the origin of the universe and having given birth to all things. And we know, of course, that uh, Dean Townsend is, is very much a lover of Chinese history and culture, and we thought that this would be particularly appropriate to you, John, for, uh, because of that. And um, we have one more thing, and this is for the university, if you don't mind. Um, the National Spiritual Assembly acts as the trustees of the affairs of the Baha'i Faith in this country. And as such, we receive the contributions of members of the Baha'i Faith from all around uh, the 48 states, and uh, very much as trustees of these funds, in the sense that those who contribute in the Baha'i Faith do so in the knowledge that the National Spiritual Assembly will only expend these sacred resources on the things that are of the greatest and highest value, of the greatest importance to humanity and to its advancement. And so we're quite proud that the National Spiritual Assembly has uh, had the resources to support the work of the chair over the past years, and we wish now again to offer another token of that support in the form of a check for $100,000 to the Baha'i Chair.
Well, thank you so much, Ken, for those uh, very kind words, uh, for the personal present for me. I very much appreciate it. And once again, to all of those who contributed, thank you very much for this. Uh, you call it a token. I, I don't call it a token. I call it an extremely large, generous donation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Judge Dorothy Nelson, as many of you know, has been a crucial figure in the history of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace. Due to her numerous commitments, she was not able to travel from California to join us in person to, tonight. However, such is her attachment to and affection for the Chair and the University of Maryland that she has prepared a special video message, which we will see in just a moment. Uh, Judge Nelson was appointed by President Jimmy Carter to the United States Court of Appeals Ninth Circuit in 1979. Today she continues to serve the Ninth Circuit as a senior federal judge. She was the founder and chair of the board of the Western Justice Center, which is dedicated to promoting peaceful resolution of conflict among children in the courts and in the community. It's a very great honor to be part of this important... She started. Okay. <laughs> I know where to shut up. <laughs> to install Dr. Hoda Mahmoudi as the third holder of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace. I have a very personal relationship with the Baha'i Chair as I do with the University of Maryland, which I now regard as my second home. It was on January 26, 1990, that as Chair of the National Spiritual Assembly of the United States, I met with representatives of the University of Maryland at College Park to sign a historic memorandum of understanding to establish the Baha'i Chair. Chancellor William Kerwin was president at that time, and Dean Murray Polakoff, the dean of the School of Social and Behavioral Sciences, among others, were very instrumental in bringing this about. And among those others, I include Eddie Kaufman, Jonathan Wolfenfeld, Cindy Hill, and then Dean Erwin Goldstein and President Moat, uh, all of whom assisted greatly. The auspicious origins of the Baha'i Chair are rooted amidst the strife of war-torn Lebanon in 1980s. Professor Suhail Bushri and Professor Ed Azar director of the Center for International Development and Conflict Management and professor of government and political um, and politics at the University of Maryland, were separately involved in working toward a resolution of the conflict devastating their homeland when they met for the first time in Lebanon in 1982. They found that they were united by a profound community of vision and purpose. When their paths crossed again in 1985, Professor Azar az urged Professor Bushri, who was then teaching at Oxford, to come to the University of Maryland to work with him toward the realization of their shared vision of world peace. Also in 1985, the Universal House of Justice of the Baha'i Faith released to the world its epic-making statement, The Promise of World Peace. Professor Azar was deeply moved by its contents, and he wrote to the Universal House of Justice on behalf of the University of Maryland, proposing the establishment of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace at the Center for International Development and Conflict Management. Then on January 22, 1993, in a ceremony attended by over 400 distinguished guests, Professor Suhel Bushri was installed as the first incumbent of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace. This, of course, was at the University of Maryland at its Center for International Development and conflict management. Professor Bushri was and is a, an internationally recognized scholar of Anglo-Irish, English and Arabic literature. 
his seminal studies on the works of W.B. Yeats, a scholar on the writings of Khalil Gibran, and a specialist in comparative literature in the field of culture, religion, and politics. It was my good fortune to be appointed by the Baha'i National Assembly to serve as a liaison to the chair. During my many years of travel to the University of Maryland in this capacity, I learned what it was like to be in the presence of a great and gifted man who had been accurately described by his students and colleagues as charismatic, inspirational, and extraordinary. Of the hundreds of letters received by Professor Bushri from his students, let me quote from just two. Quote, your class on the spiritual heritage of the human race was the single most influential class I have ever had the pleasure of taking. Please accept my gratitude for touching my life in such a beautiful way and changing the way I think and act. In the second letter, and I quote, this course made me a better human being. I am glad to have taken a course that nurtured a part of me that has been neglected in much of my education. Professor Bushby's contribution to the cause of world peace are profound and significant. His commitment to the concept of the oneness of humanity and his belief in the emergence of a world civilization that transcends all racial, religious, and social barriers has contributed immeasurably to discussion on values and the need for moral transformation and spiritual regeneration. As I did not continue in my role as liaison to the chair during the uh, holding of the chair by Professor John Brazil, I cannot com uh, comment other than to say from all that I have read, he made wonderful contributions, especially in the international field. Now, as you most must know, the mission of the Baha'i Chair is to develop alternatives to the violent resolution of conflict through conflict management, global education, international development, and spiritual awareness. Knowing this, it was a great honor to be invited by Dean and Professor John Townsend to be a member of the search committee for the new chairholder, a committee headed by Associate Dean Wayne McIntosh. It was an even greater honor to be a part of a committee that selected Dr. Hoda Mahmoudi unanimously <coughs> to be the third holder of the Baha'i Chair. I have known Dr. Mahmoudi for over three decades. She has a magnanimous and world-embracing spirit, a clear-headed approach to global problems, and an earnest commitment to addressing the problems of our times as a researcher and a scholar. For the last 10 years, she has served as head of the research department of the Baha'i World Center in Haifa, Israel. She has served colleges and universities in academic and administrative positions as a dean and a vice president. She has obtained many grants for her research and scholarly interests that are directly applicable to the goals of the chair. In sum, Dr. Mahmoudi is an inspirational leader dedicated to teaching, research, and scholarship that will extol the values of peace and conflict management. She will be a champion of core values, and she possesses an entrepreneurial spirit. I extend warmest congratulations to the University of Maryland, to the Center for International Development and Conflict Management, and to Dr. Hoda Mahmoudi as the new chair of the Baha'i Chair 
for world peace. Uh, I, I will pass on your, 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 your thanks to uh, Judge Nelson. As you noticed, uh, I know the pecking order between a federal judge and a mere dean. You get off the stage quick. <laughs> Uh, but as you know, she has played an enormous role and we are forever grateful to her for all the very hard work that she did in establishing the chair and in her continu continuing, uh, role as w uh, continuing roles as well. Our next speaker needs no introduction, but I will humbly attempt to introduce my dear friend, Sahil Bashrui. Professor Sahil Bishrui, as we all know, is a distinguished author, poet, critic, translator, and the recipient of numerous awards. He's recognized worldwide as a leading authority on the life and works of the Lebanese-American writer and artist Khalil Gibran. As I have often said, I just wish every single one of my faculty were as productive as this man is at the age of 83. Uh, it's a truly remarkable performance. <laughs> Currently, he is a professor and first incumbent of the George and Lisa Sakhem Khalil Gibran Chair for Values and Peace here at the, at the University of Maryland. And as we've heard, of course, he was the founding uh, holder of the Baha'i Chair. Uh, even before... He came to the University of Maryland in the late 1980s. Professor Bashri had worked hard at the national level and at international relations uh, in order to uh, pursue peace in many areas. For example, beginning in 1982, he served as senior cultural advisor, unpaid, to the president of Lebanon. In that capacity, he was charged with helping to achieve reconciliation among the country's diverse uh, confessional communities. Uh, during the same time, he often advised the, the, the President uh, for, uh, during official visits to the United Nations, as well as key bilateral diplomatic conferences, including some at the White House. More recently, Professor Bashuri has worked closely with His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, especially on projects and publications related to the environment and interfaith dialogue. Uh, the incomparable Professor Sahil Bashuri. Please, let's not forget that we are here to honor the new incumbent of the Baha'i Chair for Pay of Peace. Uh, when I was asked by the Dean to introduce our very distinguished colleague, Dr. Huda Mahmoudi, I really refused, <laughs> but he insisted, and as I have been well trained to obey, <laughs> both at home and here, I, I said, well, you wish. I want to make a proper introduction. This has been the most difficult, honestly, in my long 58 years of teaching, of dealing with all sorts of people, the most difficult thing that has been given me to do. I hope you'll forgive me if I have failed to honor our very distinguished new Baha'i Chair Professor. But I'll do my best. Every age has its own problem and every soul its particular aspiration. The remedy the world needeth in its present day afflictions can never be the same as that which a subsequent age may require. Be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age ye live in and center your deliberations on its exigencies and requirements. The words are from Baha'u'llah's writings. It is an honor to have been invited by our distinguished dean to introduce Professor Hoda Mahmoudi as the third incumbent of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace. 
it would be remiss of me were I to omit, before all else, to thank President Wallace Lowe for his wise leadership in promoting the best interests of our great university and for his generous support of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace. It is with deep gratitude that we also remember tonight the late Professor Edward Azar, who originated the idea of establishing the Baha'i Chair for World Peace at the Center for International Development and Conflict Management. Nor should we overlook the sterling services and unique contribution of Judge Dorothy Nelson and her late husband, Judge Jim Nelson, in this connection. To them both goes the credit for successfully establishing the Baha'i Chair and guaranteeing its success. And finally, <clears throat> no words can ever express my deep admiration and gratitude for Dean Towson for his inspiring leadership and support for the high ideals of education in general. To my successor, Dr. John Grazer, who is here with us tonight, the second incumbent of the Baha'i Chair, goes my heartfelt gratitude for the work he has done on behalf of the Baha'i Chair and for the enormous support he has given me as the first incumbent of the George and Lisa Zahim Khalil Jubran Chair for Values and Peace. The coming together of such a distinguished assembly in support of Dr. Mahmoudi is so very important because I firmly believe that Dr. Mahmoudi will achieve excellence in her services to the university, to our American society, and to the international community of today's world. We are particularly inspired. <clears throat> we are particularly inspired by the presence of our students our faculty, the friends of the Baha'i Chair, and above all, by the gracious presence of the representatives of the Board of Councillors and the distinguished members of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States of America. Dr. Huda Mahmoudi comes to us with a distinguished academic career. She holds a BA in psychology, an MA in educational psychology, and a PhD in sociology. Her academic experience has been rich and varied. She has served as Dean of the Temple of Arts and Sciences at Northeastern Illinois University, where she was also a faculty member in the Department of Sociology. She has also served as Vice President and Dean of Oliver College, where she was instrumental in an institutional transformation which won her national recognition. Her innovative ideas of institutional change attracted <clears throat> the attention of various high-profile forums, including Harvard University Institute for Educational Management and the Wharton Institute for Research in Higher Education at the University of Pennsylvania. Prior to her joining the University of Maryland faculty, Professor Mahmoudi served as the head of the research department at the Baha'i World Center in Haifa, Israel, from 2001 to 2011. In this capacity, Professor Mahmoudi led with distinction the activities of the research department under the guidance of the supreme governing body of the Baha'i world. Her responsibilities in this context included administrative appointments and assignments at the national and international levels, in addition to the implementation of policies regarding research, translation, and textual verification of Baha'i holy scriptures. The Baha'i community has long honored learning, but it, also, it is also true that it has only begun relatively recently to cultivate the habit of objective scholarship about itself and its texts that is the modern counterpart of the higher criticism. It must be remembered, however, that no other religion has had its scriptural treasures translated into a universal language as has the Baha'i faith within so very short a period of time since the inception of the Baha'i dispensation. Those of us who have had the arduous experience of working on transcribing and analyzing sacred texts know exactly the unique qualifications of those engaged in such an endeavor. In this context, 
Dr. Mahmoudi's achievement during the last 11 years has been truly outstanding. Upon assuming her duties as the third incumbent of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace in July of this year, Professor Mahmoudi faced an immediate and urgent task, namely redefining the core mission of the Baha'i Chair in a way that balances <clears throat> honoring the Chair's traditions on the one hand with offering new innovative methodologies on the other. In this regard, Professor Mahmoudi's broad concept of peacemaking, which he calls a worldview approach, promises to succeed brilliantly under this approach. The wisdom and practical peace-building techniques of diverse cultures are valued and explored, as are the contributions and insights of both science and religion. There can be no doubt that over the coming months and years, the worldview approach advocated by Professor Mahmoudi will help the chair and its community of supporters within and beyond the University of Maryland transcend the established peace studies and programs that too often are segmented into regional and functional specializations. Our university has been in the forefront of other educational institutions in promoting the principle of unity in diversity, which is a Baha'i principle itself and a cardinal foundation of what may be described as Baha'i culture. I want to repeat this because it's so important that we understand for every spiritual tradition the world had seen, a culture is practiced, as separate from the sacred tasks. <clears throat> president Law himself has been the president par excellence in promoting multicultural understanding and diversity that unites rather than divides. Our campus has always been the home where the golden rule, do unto others what you want them to do unto you, both in a spiritual and cultural sense, is respected and upheld. This cultural diversity is represented in the many institutions and programs that represent Hindu, Buddhist, Jewish, Christian and Islamic cultures. And now the time has come to introduce more fully into the university curriculum the study of Baha'i culture, which can be correctly redefined as a culture of peace. The University of Maryland was ahead of its time when over 20 years ago, it founded a Baha'i Endowed Chair for World Peace. Now, other universities are following suit and have begun to establish programs to study the Baha'i Peace message. Only recently, the University of Stanford Libraries enthusiastically announced that it has acquired a unique Baha'i collection of both books and manuscripts and stated that the addition of this collection is a great foundation for a collection to provide resources for our researchers. It furthermore described the Baha'i religion as the world's youngest monotheistic religion. UCLA is now drawing attention to its rich and extensive collection of Baha'i materials, which will enormously help in understanding the, the, the Baha'i major principles. The Baha'i Chair for World Peace at the University of Maryland remains the first Baha'i Chair established worldwide and provides the leadership in exploring the cultural dimensions of the Baha'i moral and spiritual ways of thinking and living. The leadership in this new field of research, therefore, remains with us at the University of Maryland. And truly, I can think of no one who is more committed to the noble and vital effort to identify solutions to the world's greatest challenges that prolong conflict and prevent the establishment of peace. Under Dr. Mahmoudi's leadership, the Baha'i Chair shall develop a sound scientific basis for knowledge together with corresponding strategies that will lead to the creation of a better world. The major challenges facing the whole world today and demanding the full attention of humanity are the following. The threat of nuclear annihilation, the danger of overpopulation, the degradation of the global environment, 
the gap between the developing and the industrial worlds, the need for fundamental restructuring of educational systems, and the breakdown in public and private morality. The agendas, plans, and policies proposed by the worldly wise and defined materialistic approach are not by themselves capable of bringing about true and lasting peace. As Rushworth Kidder in Agenda for the 21st Century has stated, those policies are of uncertain value without the qualities of thought, the habits of the heart, to use a phrase that sociologist Robert Biller borrowed from Alexis de Tocqueville. In his last great work, The Management of Protracted Social Conflict, my late friend Ed Azar, who was the first to propose the creation of the Baha'i Chair at the University of Maryland, stressed the need for people involved in problem-solving forums to be keenly aware of the ethical responsibilities associated with the process. Shortly before his death, Professor Azar conf confided in me that his last book was, in a sense, only half written. We discussed the need for a book which dealt with the spiritual and cultural elements which in conflict management, elements that we felt constituted a vitally important aspect of the whole issue. This statement by the late Professor Azar was made 22 years ago. Dr. Mahmoudi, I'm sure, will realize Edward Azar's hope and will create the program that will deal with the spiritual and cultural elements involved in conflict management and building peace. As Dr. Mahmoudi emphasizes, any peace program must necessarily deal with attitudes and values and highlight the importance of eliminating all forms of prejudice. But more importantly, it is only when individuals resolve to pursue as a matter of daily habit the quest for self-knowledge, inner harmony and unity that true and lasting peace will reign. I'm coming to an end. In my ways, in, my, in many ways, Huda Mahmoudi has followed the example set by her distinguished father, Dr. Jalil Mahmoudi, a prolific author, an expert in agricultural economics, and professor emeritus of sociology and languages at the University of Utah. She has understood that in order to achieve the goal of world peace, it is imperative to propose policies that will help to restructure education and above all, to encourage and develop universal education for both men and women. Dr. Hada Mahmoudi has spent, in fact, a major part of her professional life engaged in what could aptly be described as the silence of good things. Her dedication, her commitment, her sacrifices, her indefatigable efforts, her sharp intelligence, her noble vision, and her capacity for winning the love and respect of others distinguish her as one of the great servants of humanity, and in particular as a promoter of the emancipation and empowerment of women throughout the world. I came to know Dr. Huda Mahmoudi in the 80s. I met her first in the presence of her beloved parents, Jalil Mahmoudi and Badri Behnam Kazimi, a remarkable couple who embodied the noble qualities of human love and dignity. Her distinguished father was a poet. Her mother was his muse. Their love for each other was legendary. And they were, to the last day of their lives, a symbol of the Arab adage, no relationship between two people is genuine or true until each to the other speaks, I instead of you. The love of her parents and their loyalty to each other helped to create in Huda Mahmoudi a sterling character, a nobility of mind and spirit, which are the most important qualities in a teacher while character building is the purpose of all education. The atmosphere of learning and cultural refinement in her family provided what see in her today, academic integrity and an outstanding capacity for harmony between reason and tolerance. 
Professor John Grazel, my successor and distinguished colleague, and I both attempted to establish in the last 20 years the foundation of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace. Today, dear friends, is a very special day because we shall inaugurate the beginning of building on that foundation a magnificent edifice of peace. Our talented architect here is our distinguished and honorable colleague, Dr. Huda Mahmoudi. it's time for me to go home. <laughs> thank you, Professor Boshuri. I don't know how to thank you for your undeserved remarks. For a minute, I thought I was in the wrong room. <laughs> Dean Townsend, members of the Continental Boards of Counselor, Members of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States, faculty, students, my dear family, friends, and guests visiting from near and far, thank you. The University of Maryland, under the expert leadership of President Wallace Lowe, continues to enhance its national and international stature as a leading institution of higher learning. In President Lowe's own words, the University of Maryland is ascending. I am grateful for this opportunity to be able to serve at this marvelous institution. Some months ago, it was explained to me that successive deans of the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences have been steadfast supporters of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace. Although I, was, I am a new arrival to this campus, I can attest that Dean John Townsend not only continues but also enhances that welcome tradition. Under his able leadership, the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences has continued to rise by consolidating a worldwide reputation of excellence. There is a senior University of Maryland official who is not here tonight, but he played an early and decisive part in the founding of the Baha'i Chair. I am referring to Dr. William Kerwin, presently Chancellor of the University System of Maryland. In the early 1990s, when the Baha'i Chair was struggling to emerge, Chancellor Kerwin served as president of the University of Maryland, and in that capacity, he did everything possible to nurture the Chair for World Peace. Since that time, Chancellor Kerwin has remained a friend of the Baha'i Chair. The Baha'i Chair and its community of supporters owe a special debt of gratitude to Judge Dorothy Nelson and to Mr. Ken Bowers, who both have served successively as liaison between the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States and the Baha'i Chair's Advisory Board. Over the years, both Judge Nelson and Mr. Bowers have provided wise guidance to the Chair and to the University of Maryland. Equally important, they have also helped ensure the financial security of the chair. As a new arrival at the Baha'i Chair for World Peace at the University of Maryland, I would be remiss if I failed to mention the decisive contributions of my distinguished predecessors at the chair, Professors Sohail Boshui and John Grazel. Dr. Grazel was the Baha'i Chair Professor for more than five years, from 2006 to 2011. 
During his tenure, he built on the solid record of accomplishment that had already been achieved, while further expanding the scope of the chair's activities. Among the new directions in which Professor Graysell took the chair was to organize a campus-wide initiative called the Semester on Peace, which created a pattern of cooperation among various groups and individuals working to build peace. Finally, I must, of course, salute the person who guided the Baha'i Chair from its formal inauguration in 1993 through 2005, Professor Sohail Boshui. By means of his peerless scholarship, drive, and dedication, Professor Boshui infused the Baha'i Chair for World Peace with a unique vision that allowed it to make an enduring contribution. Among the numerous national and international awards Professor Boshui received during his tenure with the chair, I believe the one he may be most proud of was his receipt of the Juliet Hollister Award for service to interfaith understanding. Given by the Temple of Understanding, a leading interfaith organization that works closely with the United Nations, the Juliet Hollister Award is granted in recognition of, and I quote, exceptional service to interfaith understanding. Other recipients of this prestigious prize include Queen Noor of Jordan, former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Mary Robinson, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and Nelson Mandela. Ladies and gentlemen, with your permission, I would now like to present my vision for the Baha'i Chair and my assessment of its far-reaching potential. In doing so, I am ever mindful of my sisters and brothers in Iran, who for more than 30 years have experienced social discrimination, official persecution, and untold oppression. Sadly, the campaign against the Baha'is of Iran extends to the field of education. Young Iranian Baha'is are systematically denied access to universities. Tonight, I am ever mindful of their sacrifices. Vision and prospects for world peace. The aspiration for achieving peace has been a central concern throughout human history. Generation after generation, men and women have longed for, struggled for, and perished for peace. In the 20th century alone, it is estimated that some 60 million children, women, and men lost their lives as a result of war and genocide. Even in this, the 21st century, the human rights of more than 3 billion people, about one half of the world's population, are not protected. Some of the human rights violations that prevail today include torture, genocide, ethnic cleansing, mass execution, violence against children, rape, human trafficking, slavery, illegal imprisonment, illegal treatment of refugees, violent theft, the trade in human organs, mass deaths caused by the vicious circle of poverty, hunger, and sickness. Today, every positive or negative change that takes place in the social, economic, or, or political realm, regardless of its geographic lo location, is felt throughout the entire world. The depth and breadth of the interconnectedness of the global order cannot be denied. However, the lack of ability and capacity of governmental and social institutions to accommodate the ongoing changes and in successfully addressing new problems is a serious threat to peace and stability. The world is getting smaller, the nations more interdependent, 
Yet inequality, suffering, fragmentation, and disorder are increasing. In this situation, one is reminded of the Chinese proverb. If we do not change our direction, we are likely to end up where we're headed. <laughs> the Baha'i Chair for World Peace has a unique responsibility to advance an educational process that will create a body of tested knowledge that can be applied to foster the emergence of a more just, secure, and sustainable international order. An order that addresses the spiritual, social, and material progress of the global community. I will say more about the Baha'i Chair's goal and its vision in advancing a new direction and discourse on global peace. However, before doing so, I would like to take a few minutes to discuss two subjects that are key and central to any discussion about peace. And of course, this is in my opinion. The first is human nature. The second are some significant changes that are taking place in the world today. Understanding human nature is, an essential, is essential to any discussion of peace because an examination of what scholars are learning about this subject highlights the issues of education and its potential for building a better world. Both the 19th century doctrine that biology is destiny and the 20th century doctrine that the mind is a blank slate have been rejected as a consequence of the marvelous knowledge that is being generated by the sciences of the mind, brain, genes, and evolution. The psychologist Steven Pinker asserts that nature versus nurture are not mutually exclusive, that genes cannot cause behavior directly, and that the direction of causation can go both ways. He explains, Genes do not determine behavior like the role of a player piano. Environmental interventions from education to historical changes in attitudes and political systems can significantly affect human affairs. Today, unfortunately, aggression and conflict characterize our social order an order that encompasses political, religious, economic, and cultural systems. In fact, many are resigned to the view that violence and warring are inborn human behaviors and therefore unchangeable. Such beliefs are often responsible for and lead to a paralysis of will in all of us, a cognitive numbness which is not easy to reverse, but which must be overcome. Here, the role of education is vital in removing unfounded views about human nature. The historian Howard Zinn has challenged the view that human nature is instinctively aggressive and violent. In a 1991 speech, he said this, there is a history of wars and a history of kindness. But it's like the newspapers and the historians. No offense to historians. My son is one. They dwell on wars and cruelty and the bestial things that people do to one another. And they don't dwell a lot on the magnificent things that people do for one another in every life again and again. He goes on to say, it seems to me it only takes a little bit of thought to realize that if wars came out of human nature, out of some spontaneous urge to kill, then why is it that governments have to go to such a tremendous length to mobilize populations to go to war? Social and cognitive scientists continue to enhance our understanding of human nature. And I'd like to speak about a couple of examples. In 1994, in a period of about three months, around 800,000 people 
mostly ethnic Tutsis, were killed in the Rwanda genocide. In the aftermath of this appalling episode, the two sides of human nature, the good and bad, were exposed. We already know and aware of the heinous acts that played out during the slaughter. However, little has been said about what we have since learned about the role of the so-called rescuers. The term rescuers refers to those individuals who risk their own lives, who actually risk their own lives in order to save others, including the lives of those who were considered to be their enemies. Here, a few examples of rescuers during the Rwanda genocide is helpful to our discussion of human nature. An ethnic Hutu government soldier, despite the danger and threat to his life, saved the lives of many Tutsis by guiding them through dangerous wooded areas during the darkness of night. A Hutu pastor sheltered and protected Tutsi women. And the mosques of Rwanda provided safe havens for members of all ethnic and religious communities. We have also learned about the positive side of human nature from the acts of humanity displayed by thousands of individuals who risked their lives to save others in the 1940s during the Holocaust. Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel made the following observation about those who risked their lives to save Jews during World War II. In those times, he, he mentions, there was darkness everywhere, in heaven and on earth. All the gates of compassion seemed to have been closed. The killer killed, the Jews died, and the outside world adopted an attitude either of complicity or of indifference. Only a few had the, care, uh, the courage to care. These few men and women were vulnerable, afraid, helpless. What made them different from their fellow citizens? Why were there so few? Let us remember, Ellie Whistle says, what hurts the victim most is not the cruelty of the oppressor, but the silence of the bystander. The discipline of Holocaust studies offers important findings about human nature. At the Yad Vashem Museum of Holocaust History in Jerusalem, what are called the righteous among the nations, referring to the rescuers who saved Jews, have been honored for their acts of valor. Their actions provide insights that help us better understand human nature. For example, we have learned that at first, most rescuers were merely bystanders. They stood by as the Jews were being persecuted, their rights restricted, their property confiscated. But after some interval, there came a turning point, an intersection at which the bystanders decided to act. They no longer accepted the intensifying measures against the Jews. The rescuers then are described as ordinary people, some of them acting out of ideological, religious, or political principle, and others without any such motivations. They were women and men of all ages. Some were Christians, some were Muslims, some were agnostics, some were atheists. Among the rescuers were the educated, illiterate peasants, city dwellers, farmers, they represented people from all walks of life, including domestic servants, diplomats, policemen, fishermen, and so on. Psychologist Irving Staub has conducted five decades on research that looks at personal and social factors that lead to helping and altruism. He summarizes his results by saying human beings have fundamental shared needs. These include the need for security, for a positive identity, for a sense of effectiveness, for both positive connection to other people and autonomy, for a comprehension of reality. 
Another need which emerges, according to Staub, when most of these initial needs are taken care of, is the need for transcendence. This is an aspect of spirituality. The need to go beyond one's own material concerns and beyond the self. When these needs are fulfilled, people are well on their way to harmonious, caring relationships as well as continued growth in their lives. And he points out that passivity of bystanders greatly contributes to the evolution of evil. He points out that creating goodness requires active bystandership by individuals, organizations, communities, and nations. Given the evidence for the capacity of humans to do good, I would like to share this observation. And it centers on the fact that human beings are not instinctively prisoners of aggression and violent behavior. Therefore, intervention through education and training can positively alter attitudes and change behavior. A final observation about human nature comes from bioethicist Adriana Ginni and biopsychologist James Giordano, who state, as evidenced by history, human beings are achievers. Some are overachievers. Humans show a trend toward not merely surviving, but flourishing. Human history is punctuated by our attempts to break the bonds of biological restrictions and to be more than we are. Having examined what some of the latest research reveals about human nature, I would like to address my second theme. This concerns the monumental changes that are taking place in the world today, which pose serious challenges to individuals, institutions, and our global society, and which relate directly to the subject of peace. Our global community is undergoing great transformations. Our conventional thinking about the political, economic, and, cult and cultural components are being tested on every side. In many ways, we have not kept up with the changes that are unfolding before us. Many scholars point to the need for a re-examination of the existing fundamental ideas and theories we use to describe modern society. As an example, sociologist Ulrich Beck states that if the social sciences want to avoid becoming a museum of antiquated ideas, they must engage in a healthy re-examination of the changes at play in the world. In an effort to study realistically the pathways that may lead to peace, considerable attention must be devoted to adapting existing theories that are no longer capable of describing the changing world. By way of example, I will highlight three trends very briefly. These are modernity, globalization, often called second modernity, and the third, cosmopolitanism. All of these phenomena are indicators of the sea change that continues to shape the global order. Modernity is another term for modern society or industrial civilization. It lives in the future rather than the past as a dynamic force unparalleled in any previous type of social order Modernity is connected with a certain set of attitudes towards the world, the idea of the world as an open transformation of human intervention. Modernity is comprised of complex economic institutions, including a market economy and a variety of political institutions, such as the nation state and mass democracy. As a process, that is or should be open to change, modernity has now evolved from its origins as a Western phenomenon to what is now called globalization, which comes to my second phenomenon, 
the concept of globalization or a second modernity. This is a widely used term to describe, some by, which is by some social scientists is described as a period that follows modernity. Just as the emergence of the industrial society caused the breakdown in agricultural society, globalization has transformed industrial society into broader social and economic relationships stretching worldwide. Globalization is composed of and creates new social networks that can be located thousands of miles apart. Yet globalization through the communications revolution has also brought about a time-space compression. We no longer rely on a physical presence, but by means of technology can remove the limitations of space and time. As a result of such developments, we see a significant acceleration in the pace of life. Globalization links distant communities and expands the reach of power relations across regions and continents. It also has its contradictions. For example, although the nation state still has an important role to play, the world has moved beyond the national and the international. Both the state the, the, the state systems remain, but are being subjected to major changes. Under globalization, the state has not and cannot disappear, but globalization may be viewed as an addition to, not a substitute for, the existing international order. Globalization is not some process over and above the activities of the states, but is instead an element within state transformation. One scholar, Ian Clark, in International Relations, describes that we need to face the seeming paradox that there can be indeed an international order of globalized states. The third concept that I'd like to briefly discuss is cosmopolitanism. Cosmopolitanism refers to a set of moral standards for living in a global order. Kawami Anthony Apia, professor of philosophy from Princeton University, who would like to, all of us to know that his mother is from England and his father is from Ghana, and therefore he considers himself a cosmopolitan, he observes that today cosmopolitanism is a temperament that is to be found in every continent. He defines cosmopolitanism as the conjunction of two ideas, one which it shares with a lot of people, which is some form of commitment to the universality of concern for all human beings. That's one part of it. But what is distinctive about cosmopolitan universalism is that it combines that sense that everybody matters. Every human being is important with the idea that people are entitled to live lives to different ideals, different conceptions of what they're up to, what they think is worthwhile. Apia continues, so unlike many universalities, cosmopolitans aren't in the business of trying to persuade everybody to be like themselves. We like the fact that the world is full of different kinds of people. However, Apia is quick to point out that where culture is bad for people, the cosmopolitan doesn't have to be tolerant of it. We don't need to treat genocide or human rights abuses as just another part of the quaint diversity of species. Decades ago, in her famous work, The Origins of Totalitarianism, the political theorist Hannah Arndt offered the following observation about the negative side of nationalism as a barrier to peace. She said, politically speaking, tribal nationalism always insists that its own people are surrounded by a world of enemies. 
one against all. And that the fundamental difference, a fundamental difference, exists between this people and all others. It claims its people to be unique, individual, incompatible with all others, and denies theoretically the very possibility of a common mankind long before it is used to destroy the humanity of men. Arndt's vision of a common mankind, like cosmopolitanism's commitment to the universality of human beings, points to the fact that the examination of humankind as a whole should be at the center of our theories and empirical studies, especially in relation to world peace. Knowledge must take us to new ways of conceptualizing the world as a unity. In this way, we can carry out research in pursuit of knowledge that is relevant and valid to our ever-changing global community. In this regard, Apia places great importance on what he calls the education for global citizenship. Each person you know about and can affect, Apia says, is someone to whom you have responsibility. To say this is just to affirm the very idea of morality. The challenge then is to take minds and hearts formed over the long millennia of living in local troops and equip them with ideas and institutions that will allow us to live together as the global tribe we have become. And that means shaping hearts and minds for our life together on this planet, beginning with the education of the young. Now I come to my specific vision for the Baha'i Chair for World Peace. Having briefly sketched the barbarity that has formed much of our history, while also recalling the humanity that endures even amidst the darkest moments, we have also explored the nature of the accelerated changes that chisel away and reshape our planet into a future that from early indications is sure to be vastly different than anything any of us can imagine today. Here I would like to focus on the role of Baha'i Chair for World Peace, which is part of the mission conveyed earlier uh, by previous speakers that the chair should be a solution to the world's challenges. And you have already heard about the chair's founding, but I want to just say that when the mission was uh, placed, the mission of the chair was uh, um, developed in its founding documents, it, it said that the chair is to initiate public forums of discussing the issues proposed in the statement, uh, the, the uh, uh, promise of world peace issued by the highest governing body of the Baha'is, the Universal House of Justice. Now, what is this statement? I'd like to briefly tell you some of the contents, just some of the contents uh, that uh, is in, in this statement. But before doing so, I would like to just give you a little bit of a glimmer of why the Baha'is are so interested in peace and, and what is the history of this in interest. For over about a, almost 170 years now, the Baha'i faith has taken an active part in raising consciousness throughout the entire world about peace. And I'll start with a story that begins in December 1919, when Abdu'l-Baha, who was then the head of the Baha'i faith, received the communication from the executive committee of the Central Organization for a Durable Peace at The Hague. This organization, you may know, was formed by representatives from nine European countries and the United States, and its deliberations resulted in a policy statement expressing a willingness to accept military sanctions 
against countries that started hostilities without first making a good faith effort to resolve a dispute by submitting to international arbitration or making some other appeal to existing peace machinery. Unable to attend this important meeting, Abdul Baha wrote a letter to them, and he dispatched the letter by special delegation to The Hague. He praised the efforts of the organizing committee and wrote the following about world peace, and I quote, there is not one soul whose conscience does not te testify that in this day there is no more important a matter in the world than universal peace. But the wise souls who are aware of the essential relationships emanating from the realities of things consider that one single matter cannot by itself influence the human reality as it ought and should. In other words, everyone wishes for world peace. But why don't we have world peace? So then Abdul Baha expands on the need for a comprehensive framework for world peace, one that takes into consideration the many issues that negatively impact humanity's progress and one founded on positive values. In his letter, he sketches a plan of action that would support and supplement the goal of world peace. This emphasized the importance of applying spiritual values while exploring solutions to social ills, which prevent the realization of peace. The principles and concerns set forth in Abdul Baha's letter, as well as the themes founded in the statement of the promise of world peace, find their roots, of course, in the original texts written by Baha'u'llah, who was the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. In the late 1860s, Baha'u'llah, who was Abdul Baha's father, wrote to the rulers and leaders of the world in a series of letters which are all published now. And these leaders included the Sultan of Ottoman Empire, the um, European kings, the presidents in the United States, the Shah of Iran under the Qajar dynasty, the Pope, various religious and secular leaders calling on them to gather together as leaders and resolve their differences in order that their citizens might live under a wise and just government. Emphasizing the changes that were taking place in the world, he described humanity as having reached the condition where it would have to be considered as a single common community. He called upon the national leaders to resolve their differences, find solutions to oppression and injustice. He reminded them of the changes that were taking place in the world, which had for the first time in human history created the condition for one humanity, a common humanity, a condition that required cooperation among the nations and leaders of the world in resolving differences, removing inequality, and upholding justice. Baha'u'llah asked the leaders to adopt a system of collective security based on a shared commitment to stop aggression by any one nation. He stressed the need to create an international democratic elected body representing all nations of the world in order to manage conflicts that arise between states. He stated that an international auxiliary language would serve as a mechanism for promoting, for promoting world unity, as it would enhance communication and consultation among people. But he went beyond the global dimension of change, stressing the need for the development of values at the personal level, which he said constitutes the bedrock of society because they relate to the moral and spiritual foundation of a social order. He denounced oppression and corruption, stressed the necessity of trustworthiness and justice, emphasized the need for universal education to include values that transcend all cultures, and said that science and religion must agree. With that brief historical background, I now come to the vision 
for Baha'i Chair for World Peace. Situated at the University of Maryland, where the key features of the university's strategic mission are innovation, entrepreneurship, and engagement with the world, the Baha'i Chair's central aim is to create a learning community where students examine the complexity that surrounds the vast and complex topic of peace. Learning takes place through a process-oriented, dialogic, and reflective inquiry whereby the study of a body of knowledge results in practical means for the betterment of the human condition. Here, the relationship between science and religion is central to the pursuit of knowledge and its positive application. In, the, in this context of knowledge seeking and application, the agreement between the two is paramount. I say this because from the Baha'i perspective, it is impossible for religion to be contrary to science. Both of them are systems of knowledge. Although science can offer methods and tools of inquiry and learning, it alone cannot define the direction toward which society should move. Rather, moral and spiritual principles must face the scrutiny of science and vice versa. Viewing peace as far more than the elimination of war or the prohibition of weapons of war, the Baha'i Chair draws insights from universal values which are the foundation of an education for peace. Equally important to this foundation is the study and development of a sound scientific basis of knowledge drawn from any and all fields of study that can advance a more peaceful world and greater happiness for humankind. In this context, the study of world peace is more than, than the elimination of war and violence which are currently the dominant means for managing international conflict. Prohibiting weapons of mass destruction, as I said, although extremely important, will not move us closer to peace. Rather, peace stems from an inner state, one that is supported by values. Here, the aspiration for peace is an attitude, a will, and a yearning which promotes the discovery and implementation of practical measures for peace. The Baha'i Chair offers a comprehensive framework for working in that direction. There are major global issues which, if not addressed first, will continue to serve as barriers. Although by no means exhaustive, here is a list of but a few of them. Rising global inequality, discrimination and violence against women, tensions and divisions caused by religious conflicts, a growing culture of hate, the scourge of prejudice and racism, lack of universal education, and failure to teach the concept of world citizenship. To address these and many other obstacles to peace, the Baha'i Chair will draw upon a set of values that can help solve social problems. Students study, discuss, and reflect on correlating values with a wealth of sound knowledge that is generated in every field of study. Similarly, values will be examined and their application explored in search for solutions to social problems. In short, the chair's goal is to utilize the strength that an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary approach brings to the study of peace. One quick example of what I mean by interdisciplinary. There is an ad that I just read a few weeks ago for a position for a program called Human Dimensions of Global Change. And here's how the description of this ad reads. The Department of Earth and Environment is looking for a candidate trained in political ecology, developmental studies, geography, sociology, and anthropology. The candidate 
is expected to utilize mixed methods to explore the impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability associated with global change to include natural disasters, food security, water resources, and livelihoods. That's the direction that knowledge is going in. Staying with the comprehensive uh, framework for peace, the Baha'i chair will adopt what I call a worldview approach. This approach moves beyond nationalism and particularism and instead embraces a global or globalizing view of peace. Here, perspectives from diverse cultures are valued and evaluated. A network of scholars and international research partnerships will be formed representing multiple views on social problems. The worldview approach significantly expands and enriches, enriches the prevailing Western model in the exploration of the possibility of peace. Viewing humanity as a collective and organic whole, this approach will explore the role that social actors and structures play in removing obstacles to peace. The worldview approach is all embracing in its outlook, examining the disorders that impact all people and the entire globe. It considers the contributions from a diversity of peoples, cultures, nationalities, and perspectives. It blends and embodies the ideals of the East and the West, of North and South. To further expand the reach of the worldview approach, the Baha'i Chair, in recent discussions with Dean Townsend, has begun exploring steps toward the establishment of a global council of peace chairs. The scope of the proposed global council will, in the first instance, bring together, in a spirit of collaboration, the three peace chairs of the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences with their permission. However, in due course, it will extend to other universities, regionally, nationally, and especially worldwide. The Baha'i Chair will assume a major leadership role in coordinating this initiative, which intends to enlarge the reach of the inter interdisciplinary examination and discourse on global peace. I'm coming to the conclusion. <laughs> the Baha'i Chair for World Peace is committed to offering students a broad, realistic, and applied education for and about peace. Through a dialogic process of learning, the use of the mind, the expansion of knowledge, and insights into the realities and complexities of life we begin to imagine a world in which we work toward applying individual skills and capacities in constructing a better world. This is a process of learning that is centered on applying values and knowledge toward positive ends that transcend specific fields of study and career paths. Regardless of his or her place in society, Every student, every individual can be empowered to embrace the transformative nature of the education for peace provided by the Baha'i Chair. The ultimate goal of the Chair's teaching and research is to explore new frontiers of learning about peace, pushing forward the horizon and exploring the possibilities before us as it aims as its full aim on this journey. As astrophysicist Carl Sagan stated, what distinguishes our species is thought. The cerebral cortex is a liberation. We are, each of us, largely responsible for what gets into our brains, for what, as adults, we wind up caring for and knowing about. The Baha'i Chair stands ready to do its part in advancing a new and innovative discourse on global peace. It will do so through diligent work, 
collaboration with scholars throughout the world, research and publications, all intended to advance knowledge and understanding of how to develop a better world. We are hopeful, confident, unafraid, eager to labor on a creative path to world peace. Please join with us in this effort. Thank you very much. I just want to make a few closing comments, but just to say, aren't we lucky at the University of Maryland to have such a wonderful hold of the Baha'i chair? <laughs> you know, I'm struck by just how much has been achieved by the Baha'i chair, but now we see this worldview vision, and there's so much more to be achieved. And I promise you that notwithstanding your enormous generosity in the past, we are going to come and ask you to help us build around this world view and help with the proposed Global Council of Peace Chairs. Because I think this gives a chance for the three peace chairs, the Baha'i peace chairs, to have a truly global impact by drawing on the resources of people from the, throughout the world whose lives are devoted to peace. So I look very much forward to uh, speaking to some of you individually, and if you wish just to contact Dr. Mahmoudi directly, I'm sure she will be delighted. Just to note that the Baha'i Chair plans to publish the proceedings of this event, so you will in due course be able to look at it in print form. This has been a truly wonderful evening. Thank you so much, all of you, for coming. You have made this such a special evening for, uh, for me personally. I know for Dr. Mahmoudi, she is just so grateful that all of you took so much time to come and listen, listen to her words. Thank you very much, and please spend a little time now just talking to each other. Oh, well, yes, everybody has to shake her hands and congratulate her. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>